Jackson Cup has been named Roast Magazine's 2016 Macro Roaster of the Year. This award honors roasters of more than 100,000 pounds that produce coffee of superior quality, exemplify a dedication to sustainability, promote employee and community education, and demonstrate a, a strong commitment to the coffee industry. Back in 2003, Greg published Seven Steps to Success, a Common Sense Guide to Succeed in Specialty Coffee, which became the foundation of his coffee franchise alternative program. Through this program, Greg and his team have helped hundreds of entrepreneurs in 29 states and internationally create thriving independent coffee houses. A dozen or more join the Crimson Cup community every year. In growing his business, Greg has focused on building a mutually beneficial supply chain stretching from seed to cup. Through Crimson Cup's Friend to Farmer Direct Trade program, Greg and his team travel to remote coffee growing re regions to help small plot farmers improve coffee quality and their quality of life. So, on all those grounds, would you please help me welcome oh. Greg Hubert. <laughs> Well, uh, let me tell you, it's, it's great to be back. Uh, you all are, are wonderful people, and I see a lot of friends, uh, familiar faces, and like-minded people who are dedicated to serving the community. So that's uh, certainly right up my alley. When I came in, I was actually looking for my badge. <laughs> so this has kind of stayed uh, perfect, right? Very nice. I do remember my first day as a Columbus Rotarian. So I was really excited because I passed the test or assessment or historical helpful reminders. I don't know what they, what they still have. They still have that? Okay, well, Ken Galloway, he sponsored me. He really, he, he helped me through. Yes, sir. He did such a lousy job, he got rid of the committee. Okay. Oh, shoot. Because um, that test was, uh, I think, significant. I needed Ken to help me through it. And um, I remember being all excited to go to my first Rotary meeting. And I, so I got dressed, because they did have a tie thing back then, Carl. And so I, and I don't wear one much, but uh, I put on my tie, my coat, all excited, go down, have my $3 ready to go at the convention center parking, and then I get a funny look from the lady. I mean, you guys might be familiar with a funny look. Somebody looks at you like, what the heck are you thinking? And it was that one of those kind of looks. And I said, am I in the right place? She goes, are you Rotary? I said, yeah, I'm Rotary. She goes, you're too young to be Rotary. <laughs> OK. Well, I, I really enjoy my Rotary experience. And, and uh, like Kathleen said, I did go to, uh, from Columbus to Clintonville. Not because I didn't like anybody here. I love all you guys. Uh, but really, it was something for my business, as Kathleen said. And quite frankly, the competition for Rotary Club president there was a lot less stiff. So <laughs> had to go there. Five years ago, I, 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 about five years ago, I um, really wanted to focus on some of the stuff that Crimson Cup does, which is really working with impoverished coffee farmers and growers, and also doing things locally. And that's really the reason why I left Rotary. Um, Rotary is, a, as you all know, it's a phenomenal club. You all have fun, uh, enjoy each other's company, uh, give back to the community, do all the things that I think are extremely important uh, to do. So. Today I'd like to share a little bit about uh, myself, uh, Crimson Cup, give you a little Crimson Cup experience, and then what we'll do, what I'd like to do is just kind of, since I've been in the business now for 25 years, uh, just share uh, the coffee experience from 1991 uh, through today and then where that might be going. So let's start on uh, some of these awards, right? So cool stuff, we, um, U.S. Small Business Chamber. We were one of seven finalists to receive this award. So there's quite a few entrants around the uh, country, as you can imagine. And so when I told my kids, hey, I'm going to Washington, D.C. to receive the U.S. Uh, Small Business Chamber of the Year, my nine-year-old son had a little different take on it. He goes, he gives me the funny look, 
and he goes, hey, Dad, is that really something to be proud of? <laughs> you're, get, you're getting an award for being the smallest business in the United States? <laughs> Everybody has their perspective, right? <laughs> and as, as Kathleen mentioned, the, the Roaster of the Year Award, which we received for 2016, it is the most prestigious award in the coffee industry, in the specialty coffee industry anyway. And so we're really proud of that for a couple different reasons. One, uh, how they do it, how they do the process is any roaster in North America, and I understand there was a couple from uh, Korea, Singapore, uh, I think one from South America, so it's really becoming a, a, a global award. But anybody, any roaster could submit a thesis on their business. Uh, how we work with coffee farmers, how we invest in our people, how we invest in our customers, et cetera, et cetera. And we were one of the companies to, to pass that one. And then the companies that passed that, uh, they said, which we didn't know they were going to say, they said, all right, send us your three best coffees and we're gonna send them to four different cupping locations around the country, uh, tasting, uh, professional tasting. And so we did that and we won that, right? So that really speaks to what it is that we do. We're into coffee, we love coffee, passionate about coffee, but also the other piece of the business, which is the serving, serving others. Um, so I am, uh, I tell you what, I, I am so happy to have people that are uh, excited uh, to be at Crimson Cup for multiple reasons. As you can see here, there's, there's a lot of other awards, uh, CC Award, which is what uh, Teddy mentioned, numerous awards like Ohio's Best Product, et cetera, et cetera. And we're certainly all thankful for those reward, uh, awards. Uh, one of the things I'm most thankful for, and, and none of this would have happened if, if I don't have tremendous, wonderful people and who are all committed to our mission, uh, which is making communities better throughout the globe. That's one of, the, one of our slogans, which is coffee and community, and our philosophy of life and love. So L-Y-F-E, L -Y -F -E, leave you feeling energized. That's what we want to do as cuppers. That's what we call ourselves, coffee tasters. We want to leave you feeling energized because we believe that's contagious and that other people will love, leave others very energized. I'll share a quick little story with you. I, I was at uh, one of our anniversary promotions at our, one of our coffee houses in Clintonville, and it's uh, dollar mochas, lattes, whatever you want, it's a buck. And uh, so it's packed. And I was, it was raining, I was standing out in the, in the back by the drive-through, and this lady comes by, and, and we start to talk a little bit, and she goes, you're the owner of Crimson Cup? I said, yes, ma'am. And she goes, huh, well, I come through here every day at 6.30 in the morning. I said, well, thank you for that. That's very nice. She goes, your people are so happy. I got to thinking, if they can be so happy at 6.30 in the morning, why can't I be? Pretty cool, huh? But stuff like that is something that I look forward to. I mean, that's the best compliment anybody can give me. And thankfully, I get quite a lot of those. Uh, and, and that keeps me, of course, energized to keep on going as well. Uh, and that's one of the things that we love. We, we have fun, like you all do here. Certainly, uh, this club for me brought perspective into my life, and certainly you all have that. And it brought joy, because you guys have so much fun. Um, the fun kind of, for me, maybe began early. I, I grew up in... Uh, Worthington, Ohio, and I see some, uh, some Worthingtonites here. Worthington, not a bad place to be. I live in Upper Arlington now, but, you know, Worthington, pretty good. I really enjoyed that. Uh, I played football and baseball, graduated from uh, Thomas Worthington High School, and was recruited by uh, The Ohio State University to potentially be a, a linebacker. Uh, that was kind of somewhat short-lived. I took a couple trips down there, but then the head recruiting coordinator called me and he said, Greg, you're, 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 we're going to cut you off. You're just a step too slow. And so I was thinking to myself, I said, you know what? You know, he's right, but I might have been two steps too slow. So <laughs> thanks. Uh, but guess what? I had to go to my uh, safety school. Uh, safety school was Harvard. I uh, played uh, football and baseball there, uh, graduated with an economics degree, went to, uh, after graduation, I really didn't know what I wanted to do. 
Uh, I was thinking about a whole bunch of things for different in the career. At the time, the most popular things were high tech, uh, being in the medical field, and finance, right? And so I thought, well, I think uh, high tech would be it. So they recruited me, this uh, small computer software company recruited me to Chicago. And uh, so I, I, I went there. And uh, what I soon found out was I couldn't fall in love with computer software. Um, and uh, more than that, I think people at that company, probably the majority of them, I would say, were somewhat disengaged. And so I started thinking, well, I don't want, I'm not excited about what I'm doing. The money's great. Um, I'm not excited about what I'm doing. I want to be excited about what I'm doing, and I want to bring others into that fold so they can be excited about what they were doing, too. I remember having a moment out at, uh, I was visiting in California in Los Gatos Coffee Company. And uh, I remember sitting there drinking a cup of coffee, wondering what I was going to do with the rest of my life. This is a cup of great coffee. Great coffee really wasn't around back then. And when I finished the cup, I said, well, why not coffee? You know, I enjoy coffee. I like coffee. Um, it's not around, but I think, you know what, people will drink it more than just for the caffeine, because I was one of those drinking it for the caffeine, especially the computer software company. We had the herd in the morning. It used to be a herd, so the herd would go down, huge urn, and we'd pull whatever liquid came out of there, dark liquid came out of there, and put a whole bunch of cream and sugar into it, and that's how a lot of people started their day. But having great coffee, then I realized, huh, I bet you more people might be like me and want to taste uh, better coffee. So when I told people this, I got a, a whole bunch of other funny looks. Uh, you're getting out of high tech to go into coffee. Um, one person said, you know what, Greg, I'm going to have my husband find you a real job. <laughs> and, uh, but nonetheless, uh, I've become used to a lot of funny looks, so that's OK for me now. I moved back to Columbus in, in 1991 to start Crimson Cup, and of course did all the things an entrepreneur does, you know, work the 90 hours a week. Uh, thankfully, uh, my, my family, I could move in with them. My mom's a great cook, so not so bad, right? I was getting free meals, uh, free awesome meals, uh, and then obviously working uh, most of the other time. In 1992, I had an aha moment uh, for me in business. A friend told me, she goes, uh, you need to go into Cafe Fino in the Ohio State Student Union and see the coffee bar there. This gentleman, Armando, is working for a gentleman out of Berkeley who trained the original owners of Starbucks. And what he's doing is going around campuses opening up coffee bars throughout the country. So I said, that makes sense to me. I walked down there, walked in. I saw 20 students, professors in line. I looked at my watch the busy entrepreneur that I was, and I said, huh, it's going to take him about 30 minutes to serve those customers. I'm going to leave. So I was getting ready to leave out the door. I saw uh, customers go through the line like this. Espresso-based drink in hand probably took about five minutes. At that point, I said, hmm. I went up, introduced myself. I said, Armando, hi, I'm Greg. Um, mutual friend told me to come down here and see you. Uh, tell me how you did that. And he goes, how did I do what? And I said, how did you put that many customers through the line that fast? I'm just really interested in that. And he goes, well, everything is like a dance. There are no wasted motions. There are no wasted steps. Everything is set up properly. The menu is the way it is to serve the most popular drinks. And uh, my people are trained properly so that that way we can move people through the line. And so um, that's really kind of where I repositioned my thoughts on business a little bit. Because I was into uh, great coffee, of course, and then great service. But I didn't really know what service was at that point in terms of the business. So that really changed the way we thought about business, I thought about business, and really got into our customers and saying, look, how can we make them more successful? If we can make them more successful uh, just by the way it's going to be, we're going to be more successful too. And we'll build stronger relationships. On top of that, we can be coaches, teachers, which is something that I love to do in my life and continue to do. 
And it's something that I brought those two together, my passion for coffee and passion for teaching, uh, and it's been really phenomenal. It kind of culminated into the seven steps of success. So back around uh, the 90s, uh, really, I traveled a lot mm -hmm. through a lot of places. There weren't a lot of coffee houses here in Ohio. So I was tra traveling to Omaha, Nebraska, you know, all, really all over the country, kind of seeing you know, what worked, what didn't in the coffee bar business, and then I wrote a book about it uh, called The Seven Steps of Success. So um, this one came out 2003, is that right? I probably had the idea for it in 97, something like that. Uh, but it took me a while to sit down and write it. So if anybody, has anybody written a book in here before? We got some book writers. You know, for me, all it took, and I should have thought about this earlier, I'm not so smart, it takes me a while. Uh, I would have sat somebody down, a ghostwriter, and just talked, because that I can do pretty well. And that's what happened. And then the book came together pretty quick within about, within about six months. But this is something that is really behind us. So we take this to all of our segments of uh, our business. So we supply independent coffee houses throughout the country. We also have, actually, uh, within the last two years, a franchisee in Bangladesh. Who, who would have thunk that, right? And now I'm looking at other opportunities overseas. Uh, could be some uh, relatively decent opportunities. Uh, but college universities, uh, especially retail or grocers, uh, food service operations. So we've really taken that philosophy of teaching and training across all of our market segments. And that's why our mission at what we call worldwide, we have uh, buildings here in Columbus. Uh, that's our roasting facility. But our mission for uh, worldwide is to have the best cof coffee house products and, and teach our customers how to be successful in selling, especially coffee. Right here is our, our roasting facility. That's on Alum Creek, Columbus, uh, Bexley, really. Um, and so that's where we do all of our production roasting or heavy roasting or the over, I don't know, we're probably up to 700 million pounds, something like that this year. Uh, so that's where we do all of that, and certainly uh, I know Rotary has some things where they invite people down, so if something that people want to be uh, interested in coming down seeing our roasting facility, that's, that's certainly something we can do. We have, um, let's see here, two coffee houses. So our coffee houses, soon to be one, the third one in Talmadge, and this is something I started late. Uh, as my, uh, my other one, uh, I mentioned my younger son, my middle son told me, because we watch Shark Tank, and he goes, uh, <coughs> Greg, you would never get anybody on Shark Tank to back you. And I said, geez, Jack, why, why, why is that? He goes, well, you've been in business for 25 years, and you have two coffee houses. <laughs> okay, well, uh, he, maybe he's right, right? But... Um, so uh, the coffee house market segment for us is going to be something that I love. There's immediate reaction with the, with the customer at the transactional level. We're going to continue to grow those because I think we, that we do have a uh, specialty, um, a competitive advantage in some regards in the coffee houses. So we're going to be looking to um, grow more coffee houses. Uh, the innovation building, which we had, which Kathleen was at, that's kind of, you know, if the roasting facilities are blocking and tackling the innovation lab where we do all of our products and fun stuff, that's really where the uh, uh, sexy people hang out, right? That's the that's specialty. <laughs> that's why you were there. I didn't invite you to the roast, to, to the innovation lab. You know, we do a lot of things there. It's, it's, uh, we've been told by people who travel the country and look for facilities or go into facilities like this, that this is the best one in the country. So that's very nice of them, uh, for them to say. But that's part of what we do and the teaching and innovation part. And so maybe I can walk you through just a little bit about where we were with coffee back in uh, 1991 when I first started. So when I'd walk into, I would call on anybody, right? Anybody in central Ohio. So if you're an office, if you were, a, restaurant, if you were deli, I mean, you name it, I was just trying to find somebody that would listen to me. So I walk in, and this inevitably would be somewhere, right, if they had coffee. And the first question out of their mouths would be, uh, how much for your cup of coffee? Or how much for your coffee? How much for your box of coffee is what they'd say, because coffee came in a box. And so that's how people knew it, you know, little packets tear open. 
and, and I would say, well, you know, coffee actually doesn't come in a box. It's, it comes in a cherry, and then you, you pick it, and there's seeds in between, and then that's how we roast it. And then I got the funny look again, right? <laughs> Greg, how much for your box of coffee, right? And so that's really how coffee was uh, back then. Moving forward, when I would say uh, specialty coffee, people would immediately say, oh, you mean flavored. I said, well, not really. Specialty coffee is uh, a grade of coffee. It's the highest grade of coffee you can get. That's what we import. That's what it is that we come and roast and sell. And then, again, the funny look. Um, flavored coffee. So flavored coffee was really designed to kind of mask the taste of uh, maybe not so great coffee. And, you know, that's what that was. Now. Go back to 1992 with Armando and the Cafe Fino and some others coming into the marketplace, the lattes, mo mochas, the espresso-based drinks, right? And so this was something that I was teaching our customers, hey, because they really weren't into it yet back then in 1992, 93. There was a lot of people that told me it will never work here in Columbus. There's no way people are going to pay three bucks for a cup of coffee in Columbus, Ohio. Well, they kind of are. It's really more like five now, isn't it? <laughs> Something like that. All right, iced coffee, which you might hear a lot more about. Iced coffee was something that we were doing cold brew back in 1992. So if you see some of the things by a green company out there, I think they're out of Seattle, saying, you know, we have cold brew coffee. Well, you know, we've been doing it since 1992. Iced coffee will come around. It will be more and more popular. Certainly it's more popular with millennials. There's a whole bunch of things going on in, in the marketplace with, with iced coffee. Frozen espresso-based drinks really started happening in the late 90s, so not too long ago. So we went out and um, we make our own or have it made for us, our own powder to make unbelievable frozen drinks. This is in a blender. So these blender drinks just came around in, in the late 90s. And of course, uh, the most successful company in the world, I think, between 2010 and 2000, 2010 was Cary Green Mountain. Anybody seen these machines, right? <laughs> right. So these are single serve. Now, we, we, we do have those too. I mean, these are, are, are decent for people who want variety and who want uh, coffee to go. They want to brew a single cup relatively quickly. Uh, in terms of uh, quality, in, in my opinion, it's, it, it can be a, a B, uh, maybe a B plus, B plus product. Uh, and now coffee now. So now what a lot of people want out of coffee is what you see here, which is where did it come from? Nobody asked that before. Uh, can you tell me what it tastes like? What do you mean? What do you, coffee, tastes like coffee. Well, is it syrupy? Is it buttery? Is it, it's getting more and more like wines, right? Uh, is it chocolatey? Is it nutty? Is it berry flavored? What altitude was it grown, et cetera, et cetera? And this is one of our coffees, Costa Cabina. Uh, since we do travel all over, one of my guys was out there and wonderful, uh, wonderful rainforest, which is where this coffee's grown, and we participate in that community. But that's where we are with coffee, we're getting to be, they're, they're starting to ask, like, again, like wines, what is the ranking? Well, we send a lot of our coffees off to be ranked now by an independent agency. Is it, a, is it over a 90? Is it et cetera, et cetera? So we have some coffees in the 90s, which anything over 90 is uh, phenomenal. Again, this is ranked by uh, cuppers, professional cuppers, true connoisseurs. It doesn't necessarily mean like wines that you know, there aren't some good ones, too, that may be in 89, 85, 86, 87, right? But more and more people are asking these questions. And then hand poured. So part of the reason why I opened up Upper Arlington store was because hand poured coffees will be here uh, extremely soon, and they'll continue to grow. And what hand poureds are is really you take a little bit more coffee, right? should be a great coffee, and you make it. Um, with about the, uh, uh, you're making, you're putting more coffee in it, you're brewing it in a different way, it's going to extract the oils a little bit differently, and it basically it's going to taste better, right? And so that's what hand poured coffees are. You know, in Upper Arlington, you know, we are on social media and stuff like that, and we're promoting this, uh, we've been promoting this for a while, because it's a reason to get out of your car, we don't have a drive through there. And uh, so one of the comments was, of course you pour coffee by hand, how else would you pour it? 
anyway, kind of funny, but this will become more and more popular uh, uh, for folks as, as we go along. Uh, one of my guys who used to be, 10 years ago, he used to be with Columbus Brewing Company. He's been with us for 10 years. He came to me a few years ago and said, hey, Greg, what about hopping coffee? I said, what are you talking about? He goes, well, we're going to put it in a keg and we're going to hop, dry hop, the coffee. And I said, well, that sounds cool. I said, well, let's do it. So we got national press for this. And this is our, you'll hear more and more about this. Uh, we've had nitro for some time, for a few years anyway. And this is another way for, for people to have coffee. So if you get, go in our stores, you'll see taps. And these taps, uh, uh, it pours like a Guinness, as you can see, right? For anybody beer drinkers in here, a nice foamy head on it, nice and creamy. Uh, a little bit different taste profile. We've tested a whole bunch of coffees to try to get the best coffee that's going to brew in this in this method. And then we have some other ones too, like uh, Coco Nib. Uh, we have some ones that will come out like our Christmas uh, Christmas one, Christmas flavored one, which will be phenomenal. Just a different uh, taste prof profile. We can get it. Originally, we were just playing around with it. I'm kind of, I like I like all sorts of beverages. I like Scotch. One of the things I like. And we can get this to be, if we wanted to, really intense like a, like a scotch. So having this, for me, having this uh, really intense flavor over ice, one thing ice maybe, is, is, is fantastic. So we can do a whole bunch of things with, uh, with coffee. And then, of course, people are asking, um, more and more people are asking because it's becoming more and more important. Uh, you hear the terms a lot, social entrepreneurism, entrepreneurism conscious capital, it's great. I mean, I, I don't know, I think from my estimation, probably after 2008, these things started picking up and gaining momentum, which I think is great. You know, we've always been who we are, and if there's, if there's more people who are getting into it and really participating in these impoverished coffee farms, which is really where great coffee is grown, it's at the higher levels, um, higher altitudes, and so this is a school in uh, Honduras. We've done uh, a whole bunch of things with them. Most recently, uh, we got a elementary school involved, which phenomenal. Uh, they went around, and it was their deal to go around and raise money uh, for these guys. And they got them. Um, uh, one of the things out of Honduras is uh, you have to uh, speak English in order to go into secondary school. Well, there's no one to teach English, right? So what we did, we bought them uh, computers. Actually, this elementary school helped buy these computers. And now they have computers so that, that way they can teach uh, English down there. Pretty cool stuff. Um, and then David Lopez, another unbelievable entrepreneur. Uh, he, got his, um, he got his degree. And usually what happens with those folks who get the degree, they're gone. They're out of the community. He decided to go back. That's why we, we brought him in, actually, to talk to this elementary school, talk to some other, uh, some other customers, and it's phenomenal. Uh, this one, most recently, uh, one of my folks was in uh, Peru, and we've worked with them, partly because we can get truly rare coffees. We had this uh, farm, this village, do some things with coffee from the harvesting or the processing piece of the coffee, and um, uh, it made it just absolutely phenomenal. And so we are participating in them. They, I guess they're, they're holding up a check. They're going to have a crimson cup drying facility down there, uh, which is phenomenal. Allow them to dry more coffee quickly to provide more for their community, right? To make more money. And because we've worked with them on their quality, guess what? They can charge more, which is awesome, right? Um, and doing that. So our innovation lab, again, people are, are welcome to come down there. There's a lot of cool stuff for coffee geeks or on coffee geeks, whatever. Uh, our cupper here, he just received his Q grader. It's kind of like a, I guess you'd say, kind of like a small EA, I guess you'd say. But really, um, there's not many people with, with that across the globe um, who have that recognition. And then what's the coffee of the future look like? Um, probably Willy Wonka-esque. You know, walking into a place and seeing a whole bunch of shiny stuff, I can't guarantee any Oompa Loompas or anything like that, but, you know, there will be a lot of cool, shiny things going on, uh, different brewing methods, stuff that you've probably, most people have never seen with coffee. I think that will be uh, the future of coffee. I kind of look at it as the, the future of coffee will probably be like uh, what I call health stations, 
So uh, going in there to get uh, healthy beverages is, is where I think it's uh, going to go, and that's what we're, that's what we're planning on. Um, and I probably get funny looks for that, too. That's okay. It's all right. You know. So that's, um, that's really about, about all that. Absolutely, sure. Where did the Crimson Cup come from? Crimson Cup came from the coffee cherries. So when they're on the tree, uh, when they get to a bright red or crimson color is when they're harvested. That's really how I got the name. Some people think I got it from Harvard because Harvard Crimson. Um, that's okay too, whichever one. But yeah. definitely not Alabama. There's a story to that. I was at a show, and uh, one of our slogans back then was coffee for independent thinkers. This guy comes up, and he goes, uh, Crimson Cup, coffee for independent thinkers, you must be from Harvard. <laughs> and I said, well, uh, actually, I could be from Alabama. And he goes, no, no, no. If you're from Alabama, you'd be into liquor. <laughs> yeah. so, Greg, any concern with uh, climate change and the impact that it will have on coffee? Interesting, right? Interesting, right? Because there's a whole bunch of different um, thoughts on that, right? So I can only speak from the coffee in. So from the coffee in, what's happening is it is getting hotter uh, in coffee growing regions going up the mountain. What does that mean? Well, that's problematic. Uh, it's problematic from the harvesting of coffee and the quality of coffee, too. So uh, I was just in uh, um, Colombia. And they were having challenges as well as even in uh, Guatemala, Honduras. Now, it hasn't necessarily affected the stuff that we buy up top, but ultimately, right, it's a supply chain. Uh, and it will affect us probably more so, unless things change, right? But uh, according to the farmers that I talk to, it's been about 10 years that's going on. So in the last 10 years is when they've seen the, the temperature rise. Uh, <coughs> in the mountains, so, yeah. You talked about the different grading of coffee. So what makes a really good, what you serve, specialty coffee. Um, so the very popular green company out of Seattle, whose coffee I detest, where does that <laughs> fall in, so, sorry. Where does that fall into the grading system of what you would brew, roast or brew? Just uh, black coffee. You know, it, Try to oh, that. The, uh, the coffee from other coffee companies, I think you mentioned the green company. Um, yeah, okay. All right, so how is it different? Well, what we used to do is, uh, what we used to do is tell folks, hey, look, buy a bag of our coffee, um, whole bean, and then put it on the kitchen table, and then buy a bag of Starbucks coffee, or name your brand, I guess. And then generally, in a general sense, what will happen is, is that our uh, beans will be larger. So if you're comparing a Costa Rican to a Costa Rican or a Guatemalan to a Guatemalan or et cetera, et cetera, ge same roast. Generally, ours will be a larger side bean. And, and what that means, and also fuller, so not broken beans. Broken beans or bits are not fantastic. So, um, and that's what we used to uh, tell folks to do um, just so they can compare the difference, right, and see what that is. And, and so, you know, again, encourage anyone to do that. Ultimately, you know, obviously we want it tasting fantastic, and that's how we want to separate ourselves. Yes? This is probably a rookie question, but the dark roast, it tastes to me almost like they nearly burn it to get the dark roast. Is that a bean, or is that, a, is that the way they process it? They, uh, so when you dark roast a coffee, you're, you're really eliminating the acidity or sharpness, like if going back to wines, right? That can be a very pleasant thing to have, right? Acidity, sharpness, liveliness, you know, in the cup. Um, when, when you dark roast coffee like that, it eliminates that, the, the flavor profile, really. So it's, you know, I kind of view it kind of like a, a steak, right? So if you get an unbelievable steak, right? And you say, char the heck out of it. Um, 
I don't know why you do that. I mean, I guess some people do, but you know, I, I prefer not to. Greg, well, thank you. This was great. As we used to say, if you remember, we said, we always said the best programs are from our own Columbus Rotarians. You obviously have carried that spirit forward. We have made a gift to the Rotary International Foundation in your name. Thank you for being here today and being the have the heart of a Rotarian. <laughs> Remember, no meeting next Monday, June Bishop this Friday at the Athletic Club. This meeting is adjourned.